Hi everybody, welcome back to IndyCar on Sunday. What is it today? It's Sunday the 7th of July. Okay, I've been away for a week, as you know, on holiday. And a lot of things have been going on while I've been away, not least the march uh, in air yesterday, which I'll, I'll come back to in a minute. The main uh, impression I got from my travels in central England, I was in Derbyshire for most of the week, is that people in England are pretty much resigned to Brexit. Now, I didn't hear anybody saying we don't want Brexit. Everybody seemed to be walking around in a daze, uh, just blindly accepting the fact that Brexit was was now a fact of everyday life. The other thing that appealed to, to be the case was that nobody uh, in England was in any way aware of, of any kind of unrest in Scotland or any, uh, any kind of uh, demonstrations for independence. They just weren't reaching the English a television watcher. Obviously they've been given uh, a different diet of news from the one uh, that's available here in Scotland. So uh, my impressions in England were that they're sleepwalking into Brexit and they just don't seem to care anymore. Up here it's very different uh, and as soon as I came home the atmosphere changed dramatically. The, the, the buoyant mood from the, the air march uh, yesterday uh, was infectious. Despite the, the efforts, it seems, by the, um, the Ayrshire Council, or the Air Town Council, whatever the hell they are nowadays, um, to thwart the, the march by uh, diverting it out of the town centre on this spurious claim that there was some kind of unsafe building and they needed to close off the entire town centre. This is uh, the third time now that uh, unionists within town councils, city councils and so forth have attempted to damage independence marches all under one banner marches by sudden changes to the route or the timing of the march uh, and changes of advice given by the police or the authorities. It's a very, very desperate measure to try and lessen the impact of 13,000 people marching through a small town full of conservative retired uh, voters. <coughs> now, I noticed from watching the march that the march was very well attended, but very few people in the, the town of Ayr uh, appeared to see it. But that was because of the change of venue, largely, right, as far as I could see. Marching along the seafront and through some of the back streets of Ayr didn't have the same visual impact on the inhabitants as marching right through the town centre. But then again, that was the whole point of the unsafe building. I mean, I'd almost go as far as to say that I think that the City Council might have loosened a few bricks in the building just to be able to condemn it. But uh, that would just be speculation on my part. But the point is that here in Scotland, the appetite for independence is growing and growing and growing, despite the desperate attempts of the pro-union media uh, and the pro-union politicians to say that there is no appetite. There very obviously is a huge appetite for independence now. Recent news reports that I've seen both in the Scottish newspapers and online have shown that the organisers of the, a union rally recently in George Square in Glasgow had to admit that despite claiming that they were expecting 5,000 people to show up uh, in a pro-UK union uh, rally in George Square, somewhere in the region of 1,300 actually showed up on the day despite the fact that when I looked at the cameras, the maximum number I could see was maybe just three or four hundred, but then again, they might have come and gone throughout the day. So the appetite for the union is nothing. It's insignificant considering the tens of thousands who show up regularly for every single independence march. No matter what town or city it goes in or through, people join it and the turnouts are gigantic. And it's a joyful, happy occasion and at the same time, the same 10 or 20 individuals from uh, the, the pro-union, what does they call themselves, a force for good, uh, will turn up and shout through megaphones and wave their union jacks in a pitiful attempt to try and show that there is some kind of opposition to independence. So all this is well and good, the, the appetite for independence is healthy, and we've learned this week from John Adam, who's a, a John Adam, sorry, who is an independence supporter, uh, that the Tories' secret vote, their secret poll conducted recently to find out what the public appetite was for independence in Scotland claims to have a figure of 72% for independence if, and it's only if, there is a no-deal Brexit. There were several different um, conditions attached to the different 
but the different votes, the different polls. But the main one was that allegedly 72% of Scots would vote for independence if there is a no deal Brexit. Now whether this figure is true or not, it is a reflection of the times that the Tories wouldn't publish the result of this poll. Now, why would they not publish it? If it showed that there was really no uh, appetite for independence, they would have put it in foot high letters of fire uh, on Arthur's seat. But obviously, there isn't. There isn't no appetite for independence. There's a fantastic mm -hmm. appetite for it. Whether it's 72% or 59%, it doesn't matter. The point is, the tide turned a while ago. Uh, and there is no way for England, or I'm saying England, but English MPs, English Tory MPs specifically, but any English MPs or, or shall we say MPs in Scotland who are mm -hmm. members of English-based parties, there is no way for them to do a King Canute and try and turn the tide of opinion back. It's just not going to happen. Now, as well as this, this week... We're hearing from uh, the current Chancellor, Philip Hammond, that neither Boris Johnson nor uh, Jeremy Hunt, uh, in, the, in the kinds of uh, promises they're making at the hustings to their fellow Tory uh, members, party members, none of the promises they are making could be afforded if there's a no-deal Brexit, because the entire war chest that Hammond has managed to build up by presumably by austerity and taxing the poor uh, and by cutting so uh, social services and public services and so on. None of that uh, is, is now able to be used for what it was intended for, to try and smooth the transition to a deal if there's a no deal, because it will all be spent on the emergency uh, chaotic Brexit management trying to get medicines into the UK, trying to get food into the UK, trying to get goods in and out of a single port, uh, which is what England relies upon for most of its exports to the European Union. So, what Hunt is saying, uh, sorry, what uh, Philip Hammond is actually saying is that the past 10 years of austerity have meant nothing. Because since austerity started, we started with one trillion pounds worth of debt under the Tories when austerity began. And we were told that this was somehow our fault and that we had to take all of these cuts uh, in order, and all of this austerity, in order to repay this debt. And now we find out from Hammond this week that the debt has now almost doubled to 1.8 trillion pounds since the Tories took over and since austerity began. So it's very obvious that austerity is nothing to do with us paying down the debt. It is everything to do with controlling public spending and controlling the public and making sure that the poorest people in society, the ones who need the most help, die off from not getting enough help. We now know that there have been at least 130,000 avoidable deaths caused by austerity and poverty that has resulted from these austerity measures. So the Tories have done all of this for nothing. Basically, the, the debt is nearly double what it was, and I'm, I bet you any money the deficit isn't much better. I haven't seen figures on that yet. And England is sleepwalking into Brexit as though nothing is wrong. They're busy watching the cricket and the tennis and the football and they're being fed this diet of wonderful British sports TV where we all sit and wait for Brexit to just occur and where we all sit and wait for the new leader of the United Kingdom to be chosen by a small club of wealthy individuals mostly based uh, in London and mostly middle class and retired people while the rest of the 99.9999% of the population have absolutely no choice in what leader we get or in what policies are, are chosen for us. So how does this leave us in Scotland? Well, it leaves us no further forward, no further back, but with the independence vote rapidly increasing. The pressure upon both the SNP to act and upon the, the Tories to try and firefight this constant rising tide of independence fervour is putting pressure on all parties at the moment and it's making the rest of us feel impatient for the change that we want and particularly for the referendum that we want. And somebody asked me the other day, why is the SNP not doing anything about this? Why are they not acting now? Well, their chosen strategy, the strategy that they've published, 
uh, states that they want to wait until, first of all, we have a new Prime Minister, and that we know what the policies of this new Prime Minister and his cabinet are. So, in other words, we know what the approach is going to be to Brexit. And then, secondly, we need to know what kind of Brexit we are facing. When is it going to happen? Is it If it's going to be uh, on Halloween, is it going to be a kind of soft Brexit with a plan, in some cases, some, some sort of uh, deal that's being done? And this is the kind of wishy-washy pap that, uh, that Jeremy Hunt is coming out with, that he would go for a delay if there was a deal on the table. And we get Boris Johnson who's saying he's not afraid uh, to basically throw the entire uh, British working people under the bus in the case of Brexit so that they can have a no-deal Brexit and satisfy the small, far-right, nut-jobs uh, section of the Tory party. So the SNP strategy is to wait and see what happens with the leadership. Is there going to be uh, a general election? If there is a general election, as far as I understand it, the SNP policy would be to fight for a mandate, which we already have, which seems pointless to me, but to fight for another mandate for another referendum with the Section 30 order in it. And then if we if we win, say, 50 seats or whatever it is, then we've got the mandate and we should get the, the referendum that we want, even though none of the Tory party uh, leadership contenders has said that they will in any event give us a section 30 order even if we won every seat that we had so whatever way you look at this we're, we're waiting for Brexit basically the, the SNP is waiting to see that Brexit is irrevocable that it's going to happen no matter what kind of Brexit it is before they call the referendum I'm not sure whether this is wise or not but if they call the referendum at the right kind of time, then there should be enough time to organise it and carry it out before we Brexit. But on the other hand, if they get the timing a bit late, then we could be up this morning. Because um, if the Tories manage to Brexit us before we've had the vote, then it's perfectly possible for them to rush through some emergency legislation that says all devolved parliaments are suspended, which is what we expect them to do. So we're still waiting. And we're going to continue waiting until the very, very last possible moment before the SNP can act. Now, as far as I'm concerned here on IndyCar, uh, there are a lot of problems with this, obviously. But one of the questions that nobody has asked is why is leaving, or so we say, ending the Act of Union or the Treaty of Union so difficult? Last, last year, we watched Donald Trump just say publicly that America was withdrawing from the Climate Treaty of Paris. Now, this is a big international treaty. He was just going to withdraw from that. And then he said he was going to withdraw from the uh, international nuclear agreement that he had with Iran. Another treaty. Just withdraw from it. Nobody was asked. Nobody voted for it. No government was consulted. The administration of America just ended the treaty, just walked away from it. Now, how come America can walk away from a treaty like that uh, unilaterally without any voting, without any referendums, without any mandates, without any Section 30 orders of agreement from anybody? They can just end it. The question here is, why is it so difficult to end a treaty with England? Now, if you think about this just for a moment, right, the treaty with England is not an internal treaty of the United Kingdom. It was an international treaty which created the United Kingdom that we live in now. But the United Kingdom we live in now is a result of an international treaty between Scotland and England. Scotland can unilaterally end that treaty in the same way that Donald Trump has pulled out of these two other treaties. Because it's an international treaty between countries, we don't require England's permission to end it. And likewise, England doesn't require our permission to end it either. It's a bilateral agreement. If either party is unhappy with the treaty, they can say, sorry, we've had enough. But the SNP has chosen to go down the route of looking for consensus among the Scottish people first. So we need to have some kind of vote that says categorically to every other country that the majority of Scottish voters wants the end of the union with England and they want to remain say, in the EU. Well, the two things don't have to be tied together, but we want to end the union with England. Now, if we do that and uh, 
we, we go down this democratic route and we even go to the bother of asking England again out of courtesy to uh, sign a section 30 order to say that they will agree to abide by the result of this which is all they're doing by the way by denying the section 30 order is saying that we will not respect the wishes of a majority of Scots but if we announce that we're having this democratic vote and that we have tried and failed repeatedly to get England to be reasonable and accept the result of this at the end of it, we only really need to convince the European Union, 28 countries, that we have done everything democratically possible, including the vote, uh, to say that we want to end the Union. And if England will not play ball, then we would expect the European Union to support our unilateral ending of the treaty. Because at the end of it, when you've exhausted every single legal international obligation that you have under international law, and the other countries still won't play ball, you should be entitled to walk away. And I think that's what will happen eventually. To me, the, the Union is a treaty between two countries. That makes it an international treaty. The treaty between Northern Ireland, or Great Britain and Northern Ireland as it is at the moment, and the Republic of Ireland is a treaty between the United Kingdom and the European Union. It's an international treaty. That's why they're so scared of this problem of the Northern Irish border. It is also an international treaty. And if Northern Irish people decided in a, in a border pool that they wanted to reunify, then that treaty could also be walked away from. And this is the legacy of Brexit. And this is why England is in such a paroxysm. The people of England don't know that the Union will have to fall apart in order for Brexit to happen. The politicians know, Boris Johnson knows, Jeremy Hunt knows, that a Brexit of any kind will mean the destruction of the Union. First of all, that will mean the end of the treaty between Scotland and England, because this is a decision to leave a treaty, a treaty which Scotland had agreed to, and a treaty which England had agreed to, with the European Union. And when England acts to take Scotland out of an international treaty against its will. That breaks the Treaty of Union under international laws. As far as I can see, this is a, a zero-sum game for Boris Johnson and for Jeremy Hunt. If they take us out of the European Union, then the Scottish Union with England is over. Uh, and it doesn't matter what they say, and it doesn't matter whether they sign a Section 30 order. All we need is the agreement of the European Union and the support of the United Nations under our uh, right to self-determination, and the treaty is over. England can go in a sulk and ignore us as much as they want, but that will be to their detriment and not ours. Uh, and if they refuse to fairly divide up the, the assets and the liabilities of the United Kingdom when we, when we do end the Union, then we walk away. We take none of the, the British debt that they took out. Uh, they, we leave them with that because they took that money, they borrowed it, we didn't. They're claiming that we're responsible for about 8% of the money that the English government has borrowed over the years, even though we never sanctioned it and we never asked for any money to be borrowed on our behalf. And we are definitely uh, supporting the UK with all, over half of what we make in taxes each year is subsidising England, Wales and Northern Ireland at the moment. And when we leave, that 10% will go. Our 10% ownership of the pound will probably go as well because we're setting up our new currency. And so the, the pound value will drop to 90 pounds internationally. The, the UK, with its £1.8 trillion pounds worth of debt, and Northern Ireland now being a major millstone around their neck, and with now Canada refusing to give uh, what's left of the UK a trade deal after Brexit, that was just found out today, they're going to be in a real problem, a real fix, because the only people that will be able to rescue England from this mess is America, because they're the only ones who've shown the slightest interest uh, in Great Britain, if you want to call it that, after Brexit. So just hang on to your hats, folks. We have the right of it. We have the high ground, both legally, morally and internationally, to walk away from the Treaty of Union in the same way that Donald Trump walked out of the Treaty of, of uh, Paris on climate change and the way he walked out of the nuclear treaty with Iran. And I'm sure he's going to walk away from other treaties as well that he doesn't like. 
So if it's good enough for Trump, then it's good enough for me. We will walk away from England, but we'll have a democratic vote so that when it comes to presenting our case to Europe, we can show that the, the majority of Scots voted for it. And it doesn't matter whether English politicians agree or not. They don't have the power to stop it. It's an international treaty between two countries. And those two countries are Scotland and England only. We don't have any beef with Wales or Northern Ireland at all. We have no connection to them whatsoever. This is just between us, between Scotland and England only. If England wants to Brexit, fine, go ahead and do it. But Scotland won't be there to prop it up when it all turns pear-shaped, which it's bound to do. We will be doing our trade the way we want to with Europe, whether that's inside the European Union or with a free trade agreement of our own is up to us. But uh, at the moment I would say to everybody, keep your head. Remember that these polls and these results that are coming out from various sources in the, the Conservative government are being leaked at the moment, probably on purpose, even though the, the people who publish them, you know, publish them in good faith, these are being leaked on purpose so that we know that um, that there's a problem and that we we know that our support is growing but it might be it might be that they're over egging the pudding a little bit that they're boosting the number up a bit to make us feel that we don't have to fight anymore we always need to fight and we will continue to fight all the way up to and including the day of our uh, referendum result when we do win and when we do win i would predict that we will get over 60 percent uh, for independence. I'm not sure if we'll get 72% with a no deal or not, because we don't know if we're going to get a no deal or not. But whatever happens, support for independence is now way over the 50% mark. It's substantially past that by now. And we all know that. I think the latest, most accurate figure I saw was somewhere around 62 to 63%. And I think if you split the difference between 72 and 52, you're going to end up somewhere in the 60s. Anyway, that's about it for today. I had a great holiday. Thank you to everybody who sent messages to me while I was away. Um, it's interesting to see Andy Murray back on our television screens, despite it angering people who were uh, waiting, hopefully, for um, Killing Eve and, uh, and Casualty last night. It overran quite, quite a long way. But it's nice to see Andy Murray back. But um, tennis is not the main issue here. We have to keep our eyes on the ball, and the ball really is and always will be getting ourselves out of this union before Brexit happens. I'll talk to you all soon. Have a great weekend. Bye for now.